good evening to all the participants is indian society for veterinary surgery is highly privileged and delighted to welcome dr amit singh and all the participants to this webinar dr amit singh is working singh is an associate professor of small animal surgery at ontario veterinary college university of delhi his clinical and research interest include minimally invasive surgery and surgical site infections he is currently working as president of the veterinary endoscopy society and is an AB, acbs founding fellow of minimally invasive surgery he has published over 100 journal articles and textbook chapters and taught numerous workshops and surgical courses all around the world dr singh received received his dvm from atlantic veterinary college and completed his surgical residency training at the ontario veterinary college university of guelph his clinical and research interest includes advancing and evidence based on the use of minimally invasive surgery in small animal soft tissue surgeries now i request dr amit singh to deliver the webinar on minimally invasive surgical treatment of chylothorax dr amit sir okay well <clears throat> first of all uh, thank you so much to uh, the society for uh inviting me to speak it's a great pleasure and privilege of mine oh. yeah so i wanted to do this lecture today on the minimally invasive surgical treatment of chylothorax you know i'm not sure if this is a disease that uh, many of you are seeing that commonly it's certainly not the most common thing that we see at least in my case load but it's something that uh, you know i've researched for uh, you know almost a decade now and uh, you know it's one of my favorite diseases to treat i think that over the last decade we have certainly improved our success rates with the treatment of chylothorax you know that this is something that even now many practitioners think that this is a disease that is untreatable and may recommend euthanasia or medical management but i certainly think if surgery is feasible by the owners that this is something that we can really have a good success rate in resolving so let's get going uh you know just before we start the presentation i wanted to just quickly uh make a plug for the veterinary endoscopy society the endoscopy the ves is a uh you know please check out our website it's uh you know quick search on google will get you to veterinaryendoscopysociety.org uh we've Uh, you know as a result of covid probably similar to isvs we've uh, you know started to uh, perform some webinars and you know while while this one is finished but we've got another webinar coming up in october we've got a journal club in november and another webinar in december uh, really would love to have you as part of the society and so please uh, you know consider joining us and uh you know joining in on these webinars and this is dedicated society to the use of uh, for the use of minimally invasive surgery so for those of you with an interest you know we'd love to have you okay so chylothorax you know basically this is the accumulation of chylus fluid which has a very characteristic milky appearance this is you know fluid that's been evacuated from a dog that's got chylothorax very classic lateral radiographic projection of a dog that's got pleural effusion obviously we can't tell if this is chyle in here or not chylothorax specifically very very complex disease we don't know why this happens certainly there are numerous primary causes of chylothorax you know sometimes there can be cardiac disease sometimes there is neoplasia in the mediastinum you know the thoracic duct as we'll talk about travels in this direction from the abdomen it's a lymphatic channel that, that carries you know chyle which is mostly triglycerides lymphocytes and for some reason 
you know, it travels through the chest and then empties its contents into the venous system, you know, around the level of the right atrium. In, in dogs, the idiopathic form is the most common type of chylothorax. And essentially, idiopathic means we don't really know why it happens. We cannot find a primary cause for this chylothorax. What we often see, and this is a, a just a rotating video of a, a CAT scan of a dog with idiopathic chylothorax. What is very, very characteristic in dogs with idiopathic chylothorax is, let me just pause this video. We'll wait till it turns to the right side as we are looking in a radiograph. <laughs> what is very interesting, so here is the thoracic duct. This is the extension of the cisterna chile, which is in the abdomen. The thoracic duct is carrying all of that chyle. And in a normal dog, we will just see a simple dumping of this chyle into the venous system around the right atrium. But what is very typical in dogs with primary chylothorax is this nest or tortuous sort of dilated bundles of lymphatic vessels, which is very abnormal. This is not a normal finding in a dog that does not have chylothorax. And so we, it leads us to believe that in dogs with idiopathic or primary chylothorax, there is some sort of flow disturbance in the lymphatic system in the chest that leads to this, you know, lymphangiectasia. And this is a hallmark sign of idiopathic chylothorax in dogs and in cats. So what are treatment options? Certainly, uh, you know, there is, there has been reports of attempting medical management and medical management would consist of low fat diet, a supplement called rutin, maybe steroids, and it, these all do not seem to work. And so in my mind and in, in many people's minds, you know, chylothorax, especially or obviously the idiopathic form is a surgical disease. So what are the treatment options out there? I mean, this is, uh, you know, it can be a devastating disease. There's certainly lots of treatment options that have been discussed. You know, I think the hallmark treatment option is thoracic duct ligation. Here's an intraoperative picture of uh, thoracic duct ligation being performed. So this is the animal, this is a, a right 10th intercostal thoracotomy. So caudal is to the left of the screen, cranial is to the right of the screen. This is the aorta. You can see some atelectatic lung. And you can see some sutures that have been placed in the mediastinal tissue, dorsal to the aorta and ventral. You can't tell, but the sympathetic trunk is here. And if you can grab all of those, all of that tissue, ventral to the sympathetic chain, dorsal to the aorta, then you will most certainly grab the thoracic duct and ligate it. So this is from an open surgery. I mean, why thoracic duct ligation? So here is a radiographic lymphangiogram. And what I mean by that is contrast has been ejected into the lymphatic system, either popliteal lymph node, mesenteric lymph node. You can see the contrast entering this is the cisterna chile, this is the abdominal lymphatic reservoir, and its cranial extension is the thoracic duct. Now, this is a normal dog. You can see this is, you know, I don't have the whole radiograph, but there's no lymphangiectasia here. This is just a simple emptying of the contents into the venous system. Now, back to thoracic duct ligation. Why do we do this for the treatment of chylothorax? Well, the purpose is, if this circle is where we perform our ligation, 
you know, we certainly want to perform the ligation as caudal into the chest as possible, is that if we occlude the thoracic duct, this will create the stimulus for new lymphatic channels to form, and they will then anastomose to the vena cava or even to the azygous vein. But in these dogs with chylothorax, that means there's no chyle going through the chest, and it presumably cannot leak out from the thoracic duct into the chest. So the chyle still makes it into the venous system. You know, that, that's another big problem in dogs with chylothorax is they're losing all of that chyle into their chest. This is uh, really important, contains important immune cells that the body needs. And so it can cause a metabolic compromise if it turns into a chronic state. So this is the thoracic duct ligation and the principle behind it. You know, the on block, this is a schematic diagram of an on block. So we've got the aorta, we've got the thoracic duct, azygous vein, sympathetic chain. And, you know, we're trying to just incorporate all of the tissues dorsal to the aorta and ventral to the sympathetic chain. Now, this is, uh, you know, this is one method. The other method is to highlight the thoracic duct and just individually occlude those branches. That's totally a very well accepted technique and is indeed what we do, or at least what I do, using minimally invasive surgery, as we'll see. So that's not the only technique that's been recommended as far as thoracic duct ligation. It's generally a discussion of, you know, we do a thoracic duct ligation, and then what else do we do? You know, I think most commonly is a pericardectomy. We'll talk about why. And then cisterna chyle ablation. You know, I've done some cases of that. I've kind of stopped doing that now, but certainly many surgeons do it. Uh, omentalizing the thorax as well has been discussed. Using embolization techniques to, uh, you know, abolish flow within the thoracic duct using interventional radiology, certainly really cutting edge techniques, and then drainage techniques. You know, they don't really solve the problem, but it allows you to remove fluid from the chest without, you know, thoracocentesis, which, you know, can introduce infection, but I think most importantly is probably really uncomfortable for our, for dogs. Okay, so what's the evidence out there on the surgical treatment options? You know, I think <clears throat> it's actually not bad if you look at all of the resolution rates. You know, I think what's important is that it's a difficult disease to study because there's not a lot of cases. These are small papers, you know, not a lot of numbers in here. Uh, you know, I think the, the largest study, the most recent uh, study that's come out has been by um, Dr. Mayhew in 2017. This is the paper. It's a multi-institutional study. You know, I contributed some of my cases to this study as well. And, uh, you know, there was 39 client-owned dogs in this study. A thoracic duct ligation and a pericardectomy were performed using thoracoscopy, so minimally invasive surgery. 35 of the 37 dogs had resolution, so 95% success rate. And that's pretty good. And, you know, I think based on this study, it kind of, uh, you know, makes us ask the question, should minimally invasive surgery for thoracic duct ligation, SP stands for subtotal pericardectomy, should that be the new standard of care? for the treatment of idiopathic chylothorax in dogs. I mean, I think this depends, you know, this is obviously, this is a very experienced group of surgeons that perform this, but I do think this is a fairly, uh, you know, it's a technique that, that you can learn fairly quickly, obviously, assuming you have the equipment and the means to perform this procedure. So let's start talking about, you know, what what is making or likely what is making these success rates high and how we do these techniques. So I think thoracic duct imaging before surgery is really, really important. It gives us a roadmap. And the thoracic duct itself 
is generally, it's not, not always a single branch. You know, this is a, a um, CT lymphangiogram that has been done before surgery. And, you know, maybe in the caudal thorax where we are going to operate, there's only a single branch, which is great. But you can see some multiple branches cranially. And then again, that lymphangiectasia in the cranial uh, ventral mediastinum. This is the view that's really important. The transverse CT view is to look at the number of branches. And this is important for us to know before going in surgically. We always operate in the caudal thorax. And so we, I want to know how many branches I'm going to be looking for. And I really think this has helped success rates in caudal thorax is the CT lymphangiogram. Radiographs, you know, it's not a three-dimensional image. And so, you know, we might miss these multiple branches. And, you know, presumably we would see two branches at the time of surgery, but maybe not. So here's one way to perform the lymphatic system injection is, you know, in the CT suite, wherever you're performing CT, just a small cut down to the popliteal lymph node. You know, one thing I do is I use methylene blue and I just inject it, as, you know, one mil in the nail bed. And then within a few minutes, the popliteal lymph node will turn blue very quickly and it'll be easy to identify even through a very small incision. And then I, I place a butterfly catheter, have that connected to some contrast and then inject the popliteal lymph node usually about one mil per kilo, very slowly, you know, over five to 10 minutes. And this is a, a radiograph, the injection of the popliteal lymph node. Really cool to see all of these lymphatic channels. Really interesting. And then this is, you know, that same view, the CT lymphangiogram. You know, some people worried that, you know, if we injected the popliteal lymph node, would it open up all of the lymphatic channels? And so, uh, you know, this, this group led by Mil Ward et al., they did a study back in 2011 to compare popliteal and mesenteric CT lymphangiography. And there was no difference in the number of branches. You know, obviously the advantage of doing the mesenteric lymph node is that, uh, you know, we are much closer. You know, the popliteal lymph node is far away and it has to travel through all of these branches to get up to the thoracic duct. Mesenteric would bypass all of this, but there didn't, didn't, didn't seem to be a uh, difference in the number of branches detected, which is great. And this is the method that I would prefer. It's, you know, if, the, if you're working uh, with ultrasound, if you can just inject ultrasound guided, so it saves a few minutes with popliteal lymph node injection, so it saves a few minutes there, but if you're you or you're working with a radiology group that can do ultrasound guided injection of the mesenteric lymph node. You know, 27 gauge needle in this study, uh, three mil syringe, one and a half to two mils of contrast in one or two mesenteric lymph nodes. And it seems to highlight the thoracic duct very nicely. This is a really cool study that has come out just recently uh, out of a group in Korea and they actually injected the dorsal metatarsal region and then uh, performed CT lymphangiogram. So they found five minutes post injection of the metatarsal region with contrast and then they massaged the uh, metatarsal region to get the contrast into the lymphatic system. You know, they found five minutes post injection, very nice studies. And so that may be another way to, uh, you know, bypass the cut down, excuse me, to the popliteal region or the lymph node. Regardless, I think that whichever method you choose, you know, getting this image prior to surgery is very important. And how I explain it to the client is that this is a roadmap for me to get a look at that structure so that I know where I need to clip, you know, I'm going to try to choose an area that just has a single duct. You know, I'll probably diaphragm is here. So I'm probably going to be working around here. 
and uh, you know that's uh, this is like a roadmap. Okay, <clears throat> so now if we are going to tackle this using minimally invasive thoracoscopy, you know, what are some of the key instrumentation that is required? So I think, uh, you know, a, a you know, five millimeter, 30 degree endoscope is important. I can show you the ports that I use. A vessel sealing device is not essential, but it's, it's helpful, especially for the pericardectomy portion some Kelly forceps and cotton tipped applicators. Uh, these are, you know, probably for those of you doing laparoscopy, these are obviously very standard pieces of instrumentation. Suction device is helpful. This is kind of the tip that I use. This is a really important piece. This is a monopolar uh, J-hook uh, tip that it just clicks into a standard monopolar surgery handpiece. And then these, these vascular endo, uh, uh, endoscopic clips, the, this is what I use to occlude the thoracic duct. And we'll, we'll look at videos of that, so we'll, we'll start getting into that. So this is the setup that I use. Uh, so this is, has the dog positioned in sternal recumbency. You know, I'm gonna be working on the right side and I shave just, you know, it's a, it's, it is a big clip job but I shave this right side a little bit over to the other side. And then, you know, in anticipation for a pericardectomy where they need to be on their back, then we'll, we'll clip appropriately there. So it is a big clip job. And then for port placements, this is, you know, it is helpful, like I said, with the CT scan, the CT lymphangiography, you know, generally I'm going to place my ports this is the 12th intercostal space. So 11, 10, 9 is, is roughly where I'll place these ports. So this first one is going to be for the endoscope and then two instruments. But you can place, you can place your endoscope in any of these ports. Instruments in any of these ports really depends on, uh, you know, where you're dissecting. And, and it's not, you don't have to have your endoscope in, in one port the whole time. So this is a setup. So obviously the, the patient's head is to the right, back end is to the left. I have ports, this is 11, 10, 9. These are the thoraco ports that are used from Covidian. And then I've also made a pericostal approach and I've inserted what's called a wound retractor. And what this is going to allow me to do is, you'll see shortly, I will remove the bowel and inject a mesenteric lymph node with methylene blue initially. And then I, I generally also use a fluorescent molecule called endocyanin green. And that helps to uh, you know, visualize the thoracic duct. So this pericostal approach, it uh, allows me to uh, withdraw the bowel to, you know, again, access and inject the lymphatic system. So there's some examples. Uh, you know, the methylene blue dose, you don't need a lot at all. So I just take a 1% solution and uh, dilute that 10 times and then uh, take a, a small amount, half a mil, and inject a mesenteric lymph node or the ileocecocolic lymph node. So in this image, you know, the dog's head is to the left and I've put the wound retractor on the left side. And that's because I'm, I'm potentially considering doing a cisternic chile ablation. And I'll, I'll show you that approach as we move along in this presentation. All right, so this is some really cool technology that's, uh, you know, been popularized in a few different locations uh, in veterinary surgery. And that's using a near infrared fluorescence. And so the premise is, is that, you know, we inject a molecule called endocyanin green. This is the dose that you inject into a lymph node. And, uh, you know, using your endoscope, you can, in, uh, you can excite that endocyanin green with the wavelength of light you're using. And this is what the thoracic duct will look like. And, you know, this is something 
I still use methylene blue, as you'll see, to visualize the thoracic duct, and then I'll use endocyanin and green to make sure I have completely occluded the thoracic duct. Uh, but you know, some surgeons are using just endocyanin and green for, for imaging. And it may be helpful when sometimes you can't access a lymph node and you can just inject the ICG either in the perineal region or even in the mesentery and it will make its way into the lymphatic system. So here's uh, you know, a video. Uh, let me just pause this video first. So this is you know, the bowel that's exteriorized through the wound retractor and we've injected the indocyne in green. You can see it fluorescing because we've changed the filter on the light. So really cool to see that fluorescence. And then this is what it looks like in the animal, in the dog. This is the caudal thorax. And this is the fluorescence molecule in the thoracic duct. So it's really nice method for visualizing the lymphatic system. Obviously, um, you know, it depends whether you have the technology to do that or not. I'll just skip over that. Okay, so let's get into the operative technique. So how do we do thoracic duct ligation? So, you know, obviously I, I showed you this is the port setup. So you start placing the ports. So 11, 10, ninth intercostal space. And then, you know, I think one of the first things that's really important to do once you have your ports established is to remove any chyle that's still in the chest. So this is, as we can see here, there's still a lot of chyle in the chest. And this, you know, with the fluid in there, the lungs are still very buoyant. And so by removing, so aspirating this fluid then uh, you know we get rid of the buoyancy of the lungs and the lungs will then come out of your way. So I think an important step. Sometimes we'll have a chest tube in, so that's not a factor. We can aspirate that chyle before, but this is an important step. And then the next step is to open up the pleura that's sitting over top the aorta. So this is the caudal pulmonary ligament. This is going to be cranial. The left side is caudal. So just use some grasping forceps and grab some of the pleura. Then I'm using, this is the J-hook attachment, monopolar electrosurgery. So just using the J-hook to open up the pleura. Parietal pleura here. And this is the caudal, you know, caudal mediastinum. I've just seen where the aorta is pulsing. Here's aorta here. And this is important to see, you know, you want to aim for a window to open up between intercostal arteries. Here's the one intercostal artery. So the other intercostal artery over to the left. So I've aimed to open up between those two intercostal arteries because, you know, you don't want to, you need to know where those are. I've certainly seen um, bleeding happen from those. It's obviously a branch off the aorta, and so it will bleed. And, uh, you know, you, you need to know where those structures are. So be very careful. Some of these dogs have a much, uh, uh, much more fat tissue in the mediastinum. So just be gentle, blunt dissection. I'm just using, the nice thing about this J-hook is I can put the tip in, pull away from the aorta, and it will, uh, you know, deploy energy. So there's one intercostal artery. The other intercostal is going to show up over here and here. So the window, the area between this is where we need to dissect. Okay. So once I've opened up the pleura, then the next thing I do is I will inject methylene blue into you know, either it's a mesenteric lymph node, ileocecocolic lymph node, doesn't matter. And this is, you know, we're just looking, we've injected it, it's very quickly, within a few minutes. Just looking, caudal, you can maybe see there's some, now you can see there's methylene blue starting to come into the lymphatic system. And now we're getting a, now we can get a good look. This is going to be our thoracic duct. 
and you know try to use the least amount of methylene blue as possible. You know, you know this is the thoracic duct. It certainly doesn't need to be any more blue. So try to dilute it as much as possible. Show it again. And you know, in this in this view, I've opened up the pleura in uh, a window larger than between two intercostal arteries. You know, here's one. So I've gone beyond that to here. No. There's certainly no rule that you just have to open up the area between two intercostal arteries. Okay, so now, you know, once you visualize the thoracic duct, you actually have to dissect it. <clears throat> Don't be afraid to put some pressure on the aorta. You know, it's a very, you know, it's a thick walled structure. I have no hesitations in putting a little bit of gentle pressure ventrally on the aorta. You know, it's, it has a much thicker wall than the actual thoracic duct. You can see the intercostal artery here. And you can, you know, I just have a curved, this is a curved Kelly laparoscopic endoscopic forcep. And oftentimes it's going to be stuck on the dorsal wall of the aorta. And you do need to free this up because, you know, the, the clips are going to be, the endoscopic clips are going to be applied onto that duct. So you can't, you know, it, it needs to be separated from the aorta. So here's the clip applier. You know, be very familiar with how the clip applier works. You know, every uh, company has a different variation on, you know, loading the clips into the jaws, which you should do inside the chest, not outside. And I usually put, I mean, you probably don't need more than two or three clips. I put, you know, four or five clips. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, making sure that there's only like in this dog, there's one large branch of the thoracic duct, which is great. You know, so I've put one, two, three, four, four five, six clips here. And, um, you know, you probably don't need more than a few. You know, what I what I kind of like to see in this video or in this picture is that the thoracic duct caudal to where we've clipped. So again, cranial is to the right caudal to the left. This is starting to bulge and maybe obviously this is very subjective, but maybe this is indicative that we have a cluteral, that there's no other branches of the thoracic duct beyond this. And I like seeing that bulging. It's the same thing here in that, uh, you know, again, very subjective, but maybe this thoracic duct caudal is obviously the caudal aspect of the dog, cranial here, aorta here, that the caudal portion of the thoracic duct to the clips is, is starting to bulge and dilate. Uh, you know, so this is now where I will inject that endocyanin in green. If you don't have endocyanin in green, no problem. You can re-inject methylene blue and look. And, uh, you know, this is, this is helpful, at least for me, to see that there is no further fluorescence. So this is the endocyanin in green fluorescence. This is my clips up here. You can see aorta pulsing and there's nothing cranial to that. And so, you know, it's very, very helpful for determining, yes, complete thoracic duct occlusion has occurred. So once, um, you know, I, I don't go straight to um, CT at this point. At this point, I will, after the thoracic duct ligation has been completed, we'll flip the dog over and do a pericardectomy. We'll talk about that in a second. But, you know, after surgery, I will generally do a post-operative CT. And I'll re-inject either the mesenteric lymph node or the popliteal lymph node. And then, you know, this is what the... The CT generally is, I'm hoping to, to show, you can see contrast coming through from a popliteal lymph node injection. You'll see my clips up here. 
so clips here. And then what's really interesting in these cases is that the contrast just takes the path of least resistance. You know, it doesn't even flow up to the clips because this is a high pressure area, which is good. And we don't see any contrast going cranial or beyond my clips. And so at least, you know, with this post-op CT, I know that, uh, you know, I've done my job and there's no other branches that I've missed. Nothing going forward to these clips. It's all the contrast is all stuck back into the uh, mesenteric lymphatics. Okay, so that's thoracic duct ligation. You know, if, if uh, I've done a number of cases of cisterna chile, so let's talk about cisterna chile. So this is generally a, uh, you know, a, a bipartite structure, which is in the retroperitoneal space ventral to the first to fourth lumbar vertebrae along the aorta. So this is the left adrenal, the left kidney, ureter, vena cava, caudal vena cava, right here is the aorta, and the cisterna chile is generally lying, again, retroperitoneal space along the left side, and these are the lymphatic channels that are going essentially the thoracic duct from the cisterna chile. And what is the theory behind cisterna chile ablation? You know, is it necessary? Essentially, so again, here is uh, caudal, cranial, dorsal. This is the spine, vertebral column. Here is the cisterna chile. And hopefully we've done our thoracic duct ligation at the level of the star. And the thought behind cisterna chile ablation is that if we remove this structure, it will prevent any hypertension in the lymphatics caudal to this site, which may want to, you know, grow another channel around the thoracic duct ligation site. I mean, this is all a theory. It's none of it's been proven, but that's why cisterna chile ligation has been thought about. Um, Sackles et al., has, uh, this was an older paper in 2010 or so, has um, described laparoscopic cisterna chile ablation. So this is a, a view of the dog in sternal recumbency. This is the left kidney, left adrenal, phrenico abdominal vein. And the dissection was made in this area to identify the renal artery. At renal artery, you just find that renal artery and go all the way, here's the renal artery again, and you go all the way to the aorta and the cisterna chile should be right there. And then, you know, ablation is just a fancy word for tearing the walls of the cisterna, the cisterna chile. You know, some people say that, yes, you can ablate the cisterna chile, but its walls will reform very quickly. And, and that's, that's probably true. So uh, Jeff Runge, uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, who's now at uh, private practice in upstate New York. His group, uh, you know, described single port laparoscopic cisterna chile ablation. Um, I submitted my cases for this paper as well and essentially, uh, you know, showed that this can be done using a single port. The challenge with a single port is that your camera and instruments are coming through one incision but it certainly was a feasible procedure. Here is a video of a single port cisterna chile ablation. This is with the dog in sternal recumbency. Here's the urinary bladder, colon. Now looking forward, there's the spleen, stomach. It's the adrenal, the phrenical abdominal veins splitting the adrenal. This is the left kidney. And this is that space that we need to find. So here's the renal artery. You can find that pulse. And then once you find the adrenal artery, then you follow the, the renal artery, sorry, to the aorta. And, you know, we've highlighted the thoracic duct with methylene blue, and that's going to obviously be within the cisterna chile.
can starting to see some hints of the blue hue within the cisterna chile. And yeah, with a single port device, it is a bit challenging, but you know, you can certainly make it happen. If you need to, you can always add additional ports, no problem at all. And then this is the ablation, you know, nothing fancy. There's a the cisterna chile. We just take a hemostat and, and tear the very thin walls of the lymphatic tissue sitting on top of the aorta. Now you can see that lymphatic fluid, you know, gushing out. And the thought is, is that this is going to gush out into the abdomen and not into, you know, the thoracic duct and put any pressure on the clips of our thoracic duct ligation. Is it necessary? We don't know. You know, but it's certainly it's not that, that long of a procedure and we just tried to, uh, you know, maximize the ablation site by removing all of the walls. But, you know, for sure, I agree, it probably reforms very quickly. So that's the cisterna chile ablation. As I said, I've, I used to do this all the time, um, but now I've, I've probably for the last few years, I've just done thoracic duct ligation and pericardectomy. So let's talk about pericardectomy. Uh, you know, the theoretical benefit is controversial. We don't really know why this seems to work. The thought is that by removing the cardium, you know, this is a, it's a cadaver that's had a pericardectomy. Here's the phrenic nerve. You know, by removing the pericardium, you know, potentially this is removing any sort of constriction on the heart, which may be in uh, increasing central venous pressures, which may make it hard for new lymphatic channels to form after thoracic duct ligation. But, you know, it's been studied, the central venous pressures in these dogs are, don't seem to be elevated and they don't seem to change with a pericardectomy. So it seems controversial. Uh, so we, you know, we don't really, I still do it, uh, you know, I don't know, it's tough to justify not doing it, especially with the success rates that we've seen with it. You know, it is a harder procedure in chronic chylothorax because there's so much uh, thickening of the pleura mediastinum. And we also don't know, you know, what is the ideal amount of pericardial tissue to remove? Do we do a subtotal dorsal to the phrenic nerve? the banana peel technique, which is just to make linear fenestrations to the level of the phrenic nerve. I mean, in theory, it's very good, but it's so hard sometimes to see the phrenic nerve at the time of surgery in these chylothorax cases because the pleura is so thick. So here's the operative technique. So the dog is in dorsal recumbency. Uh, here's the xiphoid process is approximately here, caudal, cranial. Generally, I use a three-port technique. So this is the uh, paraxiphoid port. This is generally where the telescope goes. And then two other ports for the instrument. And this is a dog with chylothorax, you know, very, very abnormal chest, very thick pleura, you know, some fibrin peels. Just using Babcock forceps, trying to grab some of the tissue overlying the heart very still, this is not even in the pericardium there. Finally, we're in the pericardium. Using Babcock to lift the pericardium and trying to remove as much of this pericardial tissue as I can safely. Just using some suction to remove their small amount of fluid. Using the vessel sealer, I'm very careful with the vessel sealer. I don't want to get anywhere close to the myocardium. There's definitely been reports of vessel sealer induced fibrillation. And that's a difficult phone call to make to that dog's owner if that happens. And so I've used, you know, generally if I'm anywhere close to the myocardium, I'll just use scissors. We'll take this tissue and definitely submit this tissue as needed for histopathology. So I'm just using scissors here. So it's a, yeah, a very difficult procedure in, in chylothorax cases because of the thickening of the tissue.
you know, one thing that we use, especially in small dogs, is one lung ventilation. And what that does is that it will block ventilation to one lung field. You see this is a six kilo dog and uh, no room in here to operate at all. <clears throat> and uh, now we've initiated one lung ventilation. So we've taken away ventilation to one lung field and you can see the phrenic nerve down here so we can, we can afford much more working space in the chest if we perform one lung ventilation. So that's the, the three potential procedures, the main procedures that have been discussed for chylothorax in dogs. You know, there's definitely some complications that can happen. Sometimes you can't see the thoracic duct. You can't identify a lymph node to inject. You know, always be prepared either to do an on-block approach where you encircle all of the tissues, dorsal to the aorta, ventral to the sympathetic chain, or convert to an open surgery. Um, you know, I've had some cases as well that, uh, you know, we needed to convert to an open approach for the pericardectomy. Um, you know, knock on wood, this hasn't happened to me, but, uh, you know, other surgeons have definitely reported ventricular fibrillation when using the vessel sealer for pericardectomy, so be careful with that. Lacerating the thoracic duct, hemorrhage. You know, this is a, a, oh, see, this is a, a video from... Um, a colleague of mine where the clip was being placed in the thoracic duct. And I think the big thing here is that um, there's no visualization of the thoracic duct when the clip was being applied. And I'm suspecting that an intercostal artery was lacerated. So that would necessitate most likely, uh, you know, I think it's okay if the intercostal artery is ligated. Uh, you know, you can certainly occlude that. But you know, this video I think highlights the need that you have to absolutely see the entire thoracic duct when you're putting a clip on it. So post-operative care, you know, this is an image of a, a pleural port. You know, some surgeons put this in at the time of surgery. I don't do that. This port you can place in the subcutaneous tissues. This tip can go into the chest and you can use this subcutaneous port uh, to drain the fluid in the chest. I don't do that. I definitely, uh, you know, tell owners that it can take up to four weeks after surgery for the chest to dry up. And so I get them to come back in every week for an ultrasound of the thorax or TFAST to monitor clinically. If the dog needs to have a thoracocentesis, we'll happily do it. But if not, then that's fine. And then repeat RADS at one month. Most of these dogs are dry by one month. This is an example. You can see some clips, the caudal thorax, and then a dry chest, no fluid in the chest, which is great. Uh, if there is persistent fluid at four to six weeks, then I will recommend another CT lymphangiogram because then I'm concerned that our, our procedures haven't worked. So just some final considerations for, um, you know, minimally invasive surgery for chylothorax. Uh, you know, I've done a number of these surgeries open. And, uh, you know, I, I think for sure it's easier using thoracoscopy. Obviously, the limitation is the equipment. If you don't have the equipment, it's not possible. But, you know, it's so much easier as far as visualization of the thoracic duct. And like I've said a lot before is that preoperative CT Lymphangiography is very important. Um, you know, a big question that people ask is what procedure should I do? You know, I think obviously thoracic duct ligation is the hallmark. And then, you know, based on recent papers, probably pericardectomy. How much tissue do we need to remove with a pericardectomy? We don't know. I think removing as much as possible is important. I think one lung ventilation can be helpful in smaller dogs, but if you need to do an conversion to an open pericardectomy, I think that's totally fine. If you know, if you need to get, you know, with minimally invasive surgery, we should always strive to do what we do using open surgery and making sure in the end, you know, dogs will recover from a intercostal thoracotomy, uh, but they may not have a second chance if their chylothorax doesn't get better. So, you know, we have to do the best job possible.
And so once again, I wanted to thank all of you for uh, listening to this presentation. Uh, it's a really interesting topic and wanted to also thank the ISVS for their very, very kind invitation to have me and i um, happy to entertain some questions. Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation. Sir, we have two questions. I'll put up the questions uh, for you. The first question is, is one lung ventilation necessary for uh, minimum invasive surgery during TDL? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, you know, we, we certainly don't need one lung ventilation in uh, the thoracic duct ligation procedure because again, the dog is in sternal recumbency and the lungs kind of fall away from the caudal thorax. So you don't need it. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, uh, I'll request you if you can turn on your camera now, sir, please. Yeah. yeah thank you, sir. So the next question yeah, is, no problem. Uh, can we inject iohexol into cervical lymph node or prescapular lymph node instead of popliteal lymph node for thoracic duct visualization? Uh, yeah, you, you can't uh, inject the cervical lymph node because it's not going to highlight the thoracic duct. That's obviously more cranial. Thank you, sir. The next question is, is it not sufficient to inject methylene blue into the popliteal uh, lymph node during surgery instead of mesenteric lymph node? Yeah, really good question. <clears throat> you can do that, and I've done that in some cases, but it takes so long. It's, it's such a long time that it takes, maybe I'm just not patient enough, but it takes 10, 15, 20 minutes for the methylene blue to go from popliteal lymph node all the way into the chest. And, um, you know, the mesenteric lymph node injection, small laparotomy incision, I think that uh, it just, it's an immediate view. So one more question is just similar to the same. Uh, won't it be much easier and safer with popliteal instead of uh, the mesenteric lymph node? Uh, I mean, I haven't seen any complications. Obviously, maybe a little bit less morbidity from making an approach to the popliteal lymph node versus the uh, abdomen for a mesenteric lymph node injection. But I haven't seen any complications with that. It's a f probably four or five centimeter laparotomy incision. Um, I think the uh, pro is the much faster thoracic duct visualization. And so that uh, for me outweighs the, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more morbidity with that mini laparotomy. Thank you, sir. Sir, the next question is, do you often see collaterals in your approach? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, most times we'll see maybe two or one branches based on the CT that we do. Generally, you know, the, get the CT done the day before surgery. And so then we'll see, you know, Anywhere from one to three branches is most common. Thank you, sir. The last question is uh, pathoglomanic sign symptoms to diagnose chylothorax by a field veterinarian. Yeah, it's, it's impossible to diagnose chylothorax without actually getting a sample of the fluid in the chest. And you have to measure the triglyceride level in the fluid and compare it to the serum. But the fluid looks very, you know, if you have a dog that's having respiratory compromise, breathing faster, more difficulty, and you take an x-ray, there's pleural effusion, then you need to sample the fluid uh, in order to definitively diagnose chylothorax. Thank you, sir. Sir, we have one more question coming up. It is, does yeah. the application of CC not impose an issue with chyloperitoneum? Really good question. Very, very good question. So I've had um, maybe four or five dogs that have developed chyloperitoneum after surgery. And, uh, you know, as you know, 
the peritoneum has tremendous absorptive capacity. And so I don't mind if that happens. In fact, I'm kind of happy because then I know all of the chyle is, is going into the abdomen and it's not pouring out into the chest where if it's going into the chest, you know, obviously it's going to cause pulmonary compromise. So I've not seen any dogs that have had major problems from the chylo abdomen, which resolves in seven to 14 days. Very good question. And, um, you know, I'm sure it's not comfortable for them to have chylo peritoneum, but it, I'm, you know, I'm sure it's much better than chylothorax. Few more questions are coming up. The next one is, does the entire treatment either way for chylothorax causes hypertension? Hi, sorry, hypotension. Uh, no, doesn't doesn't seem to, you know, as long as you're carefully monitoring anesthesia. OK, sir. Uh, last question is, uh, can we inject lipidol for direct lymphangiography? Yes, you can. Uh, it's hard to get, at least in Canada, lipidol, uh, and you need to have, if you're going to do it in surgery, you obviously need to have fluoroscopy to visualize the uh, lymphatic injection. Thank you, sir. I think that's all for the question and answer session. So uh, at, at last, I'd like to say that in the past several years, minimal invasive surgery has become increasingly popular with veterinarians and their clients. As the human animal bond continues to grow, dogs and cat owners are increasingly aware of and concerned about pain resulting from surgical procedures for their pets. Clients also associate their own medical experience with those of their pets and frequently ask for less invasive, less painful procedures. Minimal invasive surgery procedure provides both diagnostic and therapeutic value, allowing veterinarians to make challenging diagnosis and carry out therapeutic procedure at the same time. So I believe that today's deliberation by Dr. Amit Singh uh, shall allow us to mitigate the challenges that we encounter during diagnosis and treatment of chylothorax. So on behalf of Indian Society for Veterinary Surgery, I would like to thank our today's speaker, Dr. Amit Singh, for his excellent presentation with substantial updation of minimal invasive surgery for treatment of chylothorax. Thank you very much, sir, for enlightening us. Further, I would like to thank the president of the society, Dr. Simrat Sagar Singh, sir, and executive secretary, Dr. Deepak Patil, sir, for their constant support for the smooth conduct of webinar. I would also like to thank the knowledge partner, Intas Animal Health, Dr. Nitin Bhatia, sir, for their wholehearted support. And not forgetting my webinar coordinating team, Dr. Deepak Tiwari, Dr. Nile Sindhu, and Dr. Amanjot from Intas for their support. Last but not the least, I'd also like to thank the audience for their patience, hearing, and time. Thank you all. Thank you very much.